With spectacular views across the Nanapa Community Conservancy and east towards Samburu, headquarters for the 2019 Rhino Charge welcomed 57 teams for their annual running of Kenya's greatest 4x4 challenge to raise funds for the Rhino Ark Kenya Charitable Trust. The event kicks off with scrutineering, where the all-important GPS units are checked and sealed. These will track the exact route each team takes between the 13 guard posts and will determine the winner of the charge. Cars are weighed to ensure they comply with the maximum weight of three tons. Penalties are applied for cars that exceed this. Safety is critical and cars are checked for five-point harnesses and driver and navigator helmets. It's also a chance for teams to reconnect and to see what developments have been made over the past 12 months. It's more than just about us, it's more to do with conservation and the animals and the environment. If we can't take care of the environment, then, you know, maybe sooner or later we, we aren't going to be here ourselves as human beings. The major aspect is, is a whole fun element as well, so, and it's something that takes us off the daily uh, life issues. So. <laughs> Fixing the car on the fly and with no, without the right tools is what the Rhino Chat is all about. Team Choms were hoping a change in colour scheme would improve their fortunes on the event. Obviously it is sunny, it's hot, so we're worried we're going to make sure we keep in mind to hydrate. Uh, the terrain, yeah, every charge has different terrain, so you know, we, we're wondering what's in store for us or what's, what's, what's the surprise that we're, we're going to get hit with tomorrow morning. The defending champions had their eye on matching five wins this year and arrived feeling confident. Yeah, defending champions, so we've done four wins now, so we're going to try and hopefully make it number five. That's our, that's our main target. Driver briefing was held at 5.30 in the evening, with new clerk of the course Don White taking over the reins from David Lowe. With 13 events under his belt as a competitor, Don brings a wealth of experience and a different perspective to the planning of this year's course. I can tell you categorically that it is a very, very special place. And whether you're a charger or a spectator uh, or an official, you're going to have a great day tomorrow. So please go and enjoy it and make the absolute most of it. It is absolutely beautiful out there. Teams, uh, many of you will be wondering whether you can get round. The simple answer is yes, you can. You can get round very easily um, and you'll have a great day, but you will not win the charge. Those of you who wish to win the charge, uh, you're going to have a very tough day tomorrow and good luck. In green on the map is what we're going to call an escape road. So the escape road is um, uh, required for this venue. Um, it does not count towards your road rule distance. So you have red roads, which count for your road rule, and green roads, which you can use if you wish to. Maps are handed out, with the crews then having to put in the coordinates for the guard posts and plot their shortest possible routes. Each team starts from a selected guard post, and the decision to go clockwise or anti-clockwise will determine which challenges they face. The map gives little indication of the thick bush, huge boulders, deep gullies and steep-sided riverbanks that will lie in wait to catch out the crews. Pre-dawn on Saturday the 2nd of June 2019 and a mixture of excitement and nervous intrepidation buzzes through the lineup as crews prepare to be led out to their various start guard posts. It's very early in the morning. <laughs> too early? Too early to ask me that question. <laughs> How does it look in the morning? How are you feeling in the morning? Good, good. Going for it this year? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. How's the morale in the morning? It's good. We're ready. <laughs> are you going for the win? <laughs> we hope so. You know, as you get older, you, know, Zika, you, don't, you lose your princess. <laughs> this is what happened. I just saw the map yesterday and it's crazy. <laughs> it's for young people, it's not for people. Yeah. For those heading out to Vineyard and Sandstorm, they'd get the chance to have a good look at what lay ahead of them as they made their way past several other guard posts.
the problem is it's thick bush where we thought we would get an advance. We haven't got an advance. But no, it looks really tough. You know, we anticipated it when we arrived at the venue. Okay. And it sort of confirmed it in our drive-in. So we're so yeah. anticipating a tough day. Maybe dead straight. 2019 welcomed five new teams tackling the event for the first time. Team Carzone brought a slightly modified land cruiser for their first attempt at the charge. You had a chance to look out there now. Yeah. <laughs> How's the feeling this morning? Oh, very excited. Very excited. <laughs> Over at Hardy, Team 64's day was already getting off to a bad start. Heads were buried under the bonnet and the tool bag was already out. Uh, I think there's something wrong with the choke. Choke? Sorry, it's not working. Oh, it's not working. Yeah, and the car is slow in power. So if it gets hot, then it'll be okay. If it doesn't, it's charged. It's okay. <laughs> Either way, it's okay. 30 years I've been in this. So, I mean, you know, we just go for it. <laughs> no, we've done enough finishes. <laughs> right, cool. There's a last chance to check your directions before the countdown and a first taste of the day's action. We're going to Vineyard. <laughs> Which route? We don't know. That way. <laughs> that way. Three, two, one. Off you go, guys. Leading the charge away from Hardy in a clockwise direction were the Magnate Chargers in their unmodified class Range Rover. They would find a way over the rocks to get out of the riverbed but would only make it to one post before their day came to an end. Team Taz headed clockwise and would travel over a kilometre along the lugger before eventually climbing out. It was time consuming but effective as they set the second shortest sector distance to Brook House. The cementers eventually decided on a direction and headed off to Vineyard, starting the day with the longest sector and taking advantage of the green road permitted on this route. Tackling the charge for the first time, the usual suspects would have to wait until next year to solve this mystery, as their day would end without completing a single sector. Their clutch burnt out and despite the crew rushing to Nanuki to get another one, they were unable to fit it and would eventually have to walk out in the dark. The Bundu Fundis started at Sandstorm with a fast and straight sector to Slater, getting into their rhythm early in preparation for the first Tiger Line to Toolcraft. The whistling Land Rover of Team 56 wisely chose to follow a similar route and the pair arrived at Slater together. Team Carzone tackled their first sector like seasoned veterans and also made light work of the sector to Slater. Heading in the opposite direction, Team 63 broke their steering in this gully and would lose three hours waiting for repairs. The Douglas Chargers set off confidently in their rock crawler, choosing the most popular anti-clockwise direction. Team 57 were moving along at their usual frantic pace and were already onto their second sector, having started at Vineyard. Moving sedately in their rock crawler, the Hatarius Chargers were also heading in a clockwise direction towards Sandstorm. The Frying Squad started at Toolcraft and were the first to attack the Tiger Line to Slater in a clockwise direction. They made good time and arrived at Sandstorm where a quick fuel stop was needed. We can drop this, eh? We can drop it down here, okay? So I want you to drop, we're here. Okay. Vineyard is pretty much. No, Vineyard is that way. No, no. Vineyard is that way. Yeah, normally keep it in the front. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, our GPS, GPS was showing it. After settling on a direction, they headed off to Vineyard. For the teams leaving Toolcraft, either direction presented a difficult challenge. Head clockwise and you'd face the Tiger Line to Slater. Opt for anti-clockwise and your second sector would be the Gauntlet. 
These teams were in for an interesting morning. Gullies were a prominent feature on this year's event and would ensure progress was slow and arduous. Team 61 decided to head towards the gauntlet, carving a route up the valley towards KWS. Team Choms would be one of the early pathfinders up to Highlands and found the rocks hard going. Eventually, the winch would have to come out. One followed suit and faced the same predicament. They too would need to winch over the rocks. The King 21s were on the attack early, taking a good line through the gauntlet and working their way up the rocky hill smoothly, arriving at Auto Express without any dramas. Hey, Boots, man! Hello, Boots. <laughs> how are you guys doing? How you doing? Hey, Danny. Hey, how, how are you? And where's your little sticker from? Right, it's behind there. Twelve, meanwhile, was heading in the opposite direction. Over at Hardy, things were heating up as teams began arriving from opposite directions. Forty-nine found some big rocks blocking their intended descent into the lugger and the runners were sent to find an alternative route. Obstacle avoided, they were soon onto the smooth sand. The smiling Shenzis were cutting a route between Satao and Hardy that only four other cars would attempt. Most teams had opted to follow the lugger to Brook House. They would tackle the Tiger Line from Hardy to Vineyard next, winning the award by over 700 metres. Team Husey would follow suit, but managed to shave 200 metres off the Shenzis to Hardy, setting the shortest distance from Satao in the process. Car 7, led by veteran Mahesh Bhatti, chose an interesting route. They were cutting a line to Hardy from Solex, creating a path which only five other cars would attempt. Later, they would attempt a route from Toolcraft to Vineyard, where their car would remain for the night. You okay? You okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The fat rhinos would attempt to reach Hardy from Brook House, their car ending up in a similar predicament to the runner's GoPro. However, they would soon put their car back on four wheels and make their way over the rocks to control. Brook House was just 2.5 kilometres down the lugger from Hardy and only one kilometre from Solex, but it was nestled comfortably in the riverbed and would be a challenge to reach. The bush babes dropped neatly down into the lugger from Solex on their way to Brook House. Team 4 were tackling the event for the first time. Their entry into the lugger was not so smooth, landing heavily on a rock and damaging the steering. It was duly repaired using a ratchet strap, then the starter refused to work. Eventually, the aptly named Giri fired into life and they were off again in high spirits. <laughs> Tell my girlfriend we won. <laughs> The hog charge team were tackling Come the straight on, line as best as was possible yeah. in their unmodified land cruiser, working their way efficiently around the course. There was plenty of action to keep the local school children excited. Back at Toolcraft, the Bundufundis were opening their tiger line from Slater, creating a crossing point which would later be used by most teams attempting the route. In doing so, they set the third shortest distance. They would also make the second shortest distance on the Tiger Line from Hardy to Vineyard. Okay. 
Team 60 were going clockwise, so arrived at the crossing from the opposite direction. After attempting to go straight up the other side, they would eventually drop back and follow 38's tracks up the river. Team 48 shaved a little distance off the Bundufundis, arriving at the crossing from a more direct line. They dropped down the steep approach with ease, and then, like a well-oiled machine, they winched up the other side. However, the fundies beat them by 18 metres. Team Husey were keeping close company to 48, the two catching and passing each other all day as they battled for the win. Team Husey demonstrated the awesome climbing ability of their machine, powering up where the others had winched. They came second on the Tiger Line. Victory, however, belonged to John Bovard and Team 5. Travelling in the opposite direction, they had beat Team Husey by 48 metres. Over at the gauntlet, Team Rouge were struggling and would eventually burn out their winch. The Bundu Fundis came to their rescue despite sacrificing 45 valuable minutes and a possible win to help them up the hill. Descending in the opposite direction was much easier for the deranged rovers, enjoying a relatively trouble-free day. Also going clockwise were the roving rogues. They chose to drop down lower into the valley between Auto Express and Highlands and would need to winch up the hill. AK-44 followed a similar route as the roving rogues but in the opposite direction from Highlands. This would end up not being the straightest line. After missing 2018, Team 42 were back in the charge. With five wins under their belt, there was plenty of experience in this team and they were once again going very straight. However, they also chose a similar route to AK-44. John Kenyali muscled his way through in his mighty Unimog, Always keen to help other competitors, he would rescue the Bundu Fundis when their electrics got washed out, towing them up to their final control, allowing them to finish the charge. Rhino Charge newcomers, Team 20, were reduced to three-wheel drive, leaving Toolcraft, and the climb up to Highlands would prove to be a difficult challenge. Climbing over rocks and tree stumps was almost impossible, but eventually they made it. Manny Choda was taking part in his 30th Rhino Charge, an incredible achievement matched only by Alan McKittrick. Powering up the gauntlet, he wasn't showing signs of retiring anytime soon. The KTM cruisers followed behind on a similar track, but a rock bounced them offline and they lost momentum forcing them to get out the winch cable. They'd be one of the first teams to complete all 13 guard posts with plenty of time to spare. 11th overall was a fair result after a cautious day. Team 5 had started from Vineyard and opted to go clockwise. This would involve descending down some serious rock faces near Satao. Alan McKittrick may have retired from driving duties, but the team was still showing they had lost none of their flair. Adil Kawaja didn't look too convinced, but Team AK-44 were confident the car was up to the task and they too made a hair-raising descent down the rock, using the rear winch to keep the car steady.
Descending off rocks requires excellent teamwork and a driver who trusts the runners around him. Storms were moving towards the venue by mid-afternoon as the action continued at the gauntlet. The Aberdare Devils had had their share of issues. An ambitious line between Copycat and Auto Express had cost them time when they were forced to backtrack and find a way around. They would weave around trying to get to Vineyard and would only reach eight controls. Peter Kinua was following precise directions as he gingerly descended down from Highlands. The team would make it to 12 guard posts, just missing out on the finish, but improving on last year's result. Making it around all 13 guard posts and finishing 19th, the charging hippos had had a great day out. Team 26 powered their way up the hill to record the fourth shortest distance and their best result on the gauntlet. They too would finish, ending up 15th overall. Team Taz were still going as straight as possible despite losing time earlier with a broken prop shaft. Benefiting from arriving later in the day, they would take second overall on the gauntlet and reach all 13 guard posts to finish 13th. Coming in the opposite direction and benefiting from a clear track, the Braeburn Sevens team cut just enough off everyone else's line to take victory on the gauntlet. It had been a smooth run for the team and they had eventually finished fourth overall. The Bush Babes powered their way up the gauntlet on the way to a fantastic result, winning the Coup de Dame. They were the top unmodified vehicle as well, reaching all but one guard post. Team One might have been missing the expertise of Don White. They'd taken an overambitious line from Copycat to Auto Express and had spent most of the morning stuck with the control in sight. Team 57 had rolled, but were fortunate that the Hog Charge team were nearby to lend them some oil to get going again. It was par for the course for this team, but they would still manage to finish 10th overall. The approach to Satao was a myriad of gullies, which the Hatarius Chargers in their rock crawler negotiated with more ease than most of their fellow competitors. A good day saw them finish 18th. Team 63 were playing catch-up after spending most of the morning drinking coffee. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. This is a good judge. Uh, how many checkpoints so far? Uh, not that many. Six. Six. We broke our truck for about four hours. We're, we're catching up. There was plenty going on at Copycat as the day drew to a close. The smiling Shenzis eased their way off the rocks at Copycat, dropping down to the river. It wasn't long before they were seen powering their way out to the hill heading to Tire World. They'd have to cut and run to make it back to their final control, but still finished sixth overall. Team 4 snorted their way around the course, wondering what could have been were it not for the broken steering. The newcomers made it home to all 13 guard posts, just as the heavens opened to finish 16th overall on their first there attempt. Well done, guys. Thank you very much. First charge? Yeah, first run of charge. How was it? It was tough, tough and gruelling. Team 12 also made it home, reaching all 13 guard posts, despite an interesting day. Yeah, it was tough. We rolled the car, broke our steering rod. Two punches. But you finished. Yeah. 20 cars would finish the charge in 2019, despite the rain that pounded down as the teams headed to their final controls. Hey, well 
Several teams would have to abandon their cars as the rivers rose. The hog charge team would get rescued by Team 57, who repaid them in kind for services rendered earlier in the day. The local taxis were grateful there were some rhino charge vehicles around to help them across this river. It was the largest contingent of finishers for several years and testament to the excellent venue and course layout by the organisers for this event. I had a very clear vision of what I wanted to achieve and that vision was I wanted the event to be achievable for many teams um, but I also wanted to make sure that the people that won it truly, truly deserved that. Team 42 made a magnificent return to the charge proving why they're five times winners. Experience and strong teamwork are the keys to success and they would finish third overall. After many years of showing great potential, Team Hoosie finally made it onto the podium. They'd played tag all day with 48 and would eventually finish just 170 metres off the lead. Victory number five for Team 48 and back-to-back -back wins for the Masters of the Charge means they join the record held by Team 42. They'd done just enough to beat Team Hoosie and richly deserved this victory. This year's Victor Ladorum Award, which is calculated by taking two centimetres off for every shilling raised, was presented to Team AK44. Based on this calculation, they did minus 307 kilometres. I am very, very happy and delighted that we were able to achieve it. We uh, managed to raise uh, 17 million shillings and that had an effect on the correction of about minus 301 kilometres. So we are quite well chuffed. It's been a difficult year for many of the charges to collect funds. Uh, our usual sponsors have also struggled a little bit, but we are pleased to say that we were able to re you know, raise the second highest amount uh, this year. After a night of heavy rain, the prize giving was held inside the HQ marquee, although thankfully the sun came out for the occasion. The podium teams in their overall classification were presented their awards together. Between them, they'd won 10 out of the 31 charges to date. I think we're I think we're equal with Kahartley and McCray. I think they've won five. That was our mission to get to five. So we're both on five now. And as I said yesterday, it means a lot to us to kind of be here. And yeah, the fifth victory to us is it means a lot. And I mean this one I think is the toughest one we've ever done. In the first three checkpoints, we winched up and down some crazy, crazy stuff. So it was it was absolutely awesome. Rhino Charge is a fundraising event for the Rhino Ark Kenya Charitable Trust and the biggest applause is always reserved for the highest fundraisers. This year, the Magnet Chargers took third overall with 15 million and 15,000 shillings. Team AK44, who had had a great charge finishing seventh overall, were the second highest fundraisers at 17 million shillings. Peter Kinua's team, Car 23, once again raised the highest funds, an incredible 19 million shillings. Once again, Rhino Chargers raised an astounding sum of money. In 2019, they raised 156 million, 336,331 shillings. This incredible support once again underlines the commitment of all those involved in the event, sponsors, family and friends, to safeguarding Kenya's mountain water towers and forest ecosystems. The Nanapa Community Conservancy would receive 4,699,000 shillings through the land access fee charged to every vehicle entering the spectacular venue. Rhino Ark, under the guidance and oversight of Christian Lambrecht, will use this money to continue the fencing of Mount Kenya, maintenance of the Abadair and Aburu forest fences, expansion of projects in the Mao forest complex, education and community projects in areas bordering these fence line projects, and the continued support of private and government entities for the conservation and protection of these vital ecosystems for future generations of Kenya. At the beginning of 2019, catastrophic fires broke out on the slopes of Mount Kenya and on the Aberdare Mountains after a prolonged dry season. 
fanned by high winds, the fire spread, burning an area of 17,000 hectares of moorland on Mount Kenya and a further 2,300 hectares of the Aberdare moorland and bamboo vegetation. Rhino Arc mobilised two crop dusters and helicopters with Bambi buckets to help douse the flames at a cost to the trust of over 18 million shillings. These helicopters also transported firefighters to remote areas that would have been impossible to reach quickly on the ground. Working with the Mount Kenya Trust and partners in the private sector, Kenya Forest Service, Kenya Defence Forces, community volunteers and Kenya Wildlife Service, it took two weeks to get the fires under control. Without the aerial support mobilised by Rhino Arc, these fires would have taken much longer to extinguish and burnt a much greater area. You can be a part of the charge by visiting www.rhinoarc.org to find out more about these vital conservation initiatives and donating to support this work. The Rhino Charge is run by volunteers who give up their personal time to search out and prepare the venue each year. Don White and his team are already on the road in search of another incredible venue for 2020, scouring the bush and liaising with local communities. We've no doubt it will be another epic adventure. We'll see you there.